three. Greetings to you all and welcome to a virtual tour of the African-American landscape artist of the mid-century Florida. My name is David Wilkins and I'm the president of the Minnesota branch of Asala and on behalf of the Florida Coalition of Asala branches it's my privilege to introduce you to our curator for this beautiful exhibit, Ms. Radia Lovett Harper. Radia is an artist and a museum professional with more than 30 years of experience. Prior to launching her arts and museum management consulting firm, she served in leadership roles at several organizations, including vice director of education and program development at the Brooklyn Museum, executive director of the Museum of African American Art in Tampa, Florida, and as an assistant professor at the Teachers College of Columbia University. Uh, Radia, thank you for um, joining us for this conversation. And I'm going to share my screen. We're going to see a short video, and then we're going to ask Radia to uh, curate us through this, this beautiful work. Uh, you'll notice Radia and I attempting to communicate uh, moving on. So you'll see some, some movement between us and, and I hope you understand what's going on. So let me share the screen and let's start with our short video. I love that piece. It uh, gives us a little taste of uh, the art and, and a great, uh, great, great uh, bit of music to accompany. So Radia, thank yes. you for bringing this important art to our community. Uh, but this is not your first encounter with these painters and their art. Tell us about your history, please. Thank you very much for inviting me to speak to our Asala family at the convention. Uh, I'm happy to talk about this show because I love seeing the objects again through the video. Um, you know, when you're at home, once you've been looking at the paintings for a year, it's hard to kind of let them go. Uh, and I haven't looked at the paintings in reality in my space, but rather did, you know, nine by 10 color copies of each painting and hung them around so I could live with them and interact with them. and. They were really great to live with, I have to say. They're really beautiful and, you know, they're healing. They're healing. Every time I looked up with a question, I looked at a painting and I said, oh, yes, there it is. Um, and I'm, I'm happy that I had that kind of experience because 25 years ago, I was here in, in uh, Florida for two years as the executive director of the Museum for African American Art in Tampa, Florida. And I arrived in uh june of 1996 and there was there were a few exhibitions on the calendar that i had to attend to um they were not my choices but they were promised we were committed so i saw on the list there was this show called the highwaymen and it was going up in uh you know about a month two months uh so i ran to the collector who was loaning for the show he was in Sebring and I um, heard about the highwaymen. I had not heard about them. I came from New York. I had not heard about these Florida artists. I knew other Florida artists. And I met uh, the collector and we talked about the work and I thought, okay, um, 
let's hang the show and I'll select some of the paintings. And we had a beautiful show and many of the artists, uh, some of you might know them as the highwaymen. Um, we call them the highwaymen I did back 25 years ago. And uh, a, a lot of them were still with us. They were still living and a lot of them came to the opening, which was so exciting. Uh, you always want to, you know, it's always more exciting when a living artist can talk about their work or just be, you can be in their presence and feel their energy and uh, get to talk to them about what, what um, led them to create, um, what motivated them. But this time around, I'm back in Florida, been back in Florida for a year or two, and I got a call. Actually, a year ago, I got a call from Selby Gardens, from um, Vice President of education and engagement, who said that um, someone had recommended me. And of course, that someone was our own Vicki Oldham. <laughs> Many of us in the audience know Vicki. She's a force in Sarasota, uh, bringing our history and culture of Sarasota to life. And the person on the phone said that I had been referred to, to, to Selby Gardens and that <clears throat> they had an opportunity to do a show on the Highwaymen. And would I be interested? And so 25 years later, I know a lot more. I know that uh, the Highwaymen exhibitions, there have been a lot of them. There have been three or four right in Sarasota. There was one in Tampa. There was one in St. Pete. There's one in Orlando. There's one. In... So I said, well, you know, do we really need another Highwaymen show? You know, haven't there been enough? And <clears throat> this person said to me, well, you know, well, we haven't real. Oh, well, I said, OK, the only <laughs> way that I agree to do this show is if I can um, present it from an African-American perspective. Because as far as I know, I'm the only African-American who has exhibited the artists at, 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 uh, at, in, in a museum. And most everybody talks about the highwaymen. I don't want to talk about the highwaymen. I did not want to talk about the highwaymen because I knew for a fact that, I even knew this 20 years ago, I just didn't know what to do with this information at the time. The artists did not call themselves that. This collector 20 years ago that I met, he came up with this name as a way to talk about uh, how they developed or more than developed, how they implemented their marketing scheme, which was to <laughs> drive cars up and down the highway on the other coast of Florida, on the <laughs> east coast of Florida and um, sell their paintings from the highway. And, you know, I'm, I've been in the museum world all these years, 30 plus years and 12 years, my last, you know, full-time job at the Brooklyn Museum, 12 years, I saw a lot of exhibitions, met a lot of artists, talked to a lot of curators and <clears throat> saw a lot of art genre, art periods from the beginning of time to today. And nobody was talking about, um, a group name that had been given to them by somebody else. In the museum world, in the gallery world, probably in your own home, we talk about the name of the artist. We talk about the artist. Right. You know, for instance, the, the, the exhibition on Sam Gilliam that was just at Ringling Museum, you know, we talked about Sam Gilliam. We did not mm -hmm. talk about anybody else. Or we did not assign a name to, to right. Sam to talk about the period of art in which he cre he created, which is something else. And so I, I said to the person who became my colleague at the Selby Gardens, um, the Living Museum, that, you know, if I could talk about these folks as people, if I could bring individuals to life, if I could learn about um, what motivated them, what was their influence, how was art important to them, how did they live? in America, in Florida, during segregation. Uh, mm -hmm. If I could do that, then I would really be interested in doing the show. Excellent. And she said, yes. <laughs> so let's, <laughs> let's, let's do that. Let's talk about some of these artists. And let Shall me look, advance, advance yeah, our slide let's, here. Let's look at somebody. OK. So we're not at the gallery at the Selby Garden and the show is on view currently and we'll be there until September 26th. Mm -hmm. And so this is just a snapshot. We have a bunch of slides, we have several slides and it's not meant to, our conversation, David, uh, our conversation is not meant to um, 
our conversation is meant to talk about the history of Black culture that creates. And yes. in, this, in this particular instance, we're talking about African-American men and one woman who starting in about mid 50s, 59 to 71, um, and really till today, but we at the Selby Museum, our show is focused on 59 to 70 because those are the years that Alfred Hare, one of the main protagonists and Harold Newton is the second, mm -hmm. um, were creating at a level that um, is very profound, was very, they were very prolific. And it was the time period in which Alfred Hare, if you wanna to go to the, do we have him as the next slide or we have somebody else, we have Zenobia. Okay, we can go back to Harold if you don't okay. mind. All right. It was the time period when Alfred Hare um, was living. Alfred Hare died young at, mm -hmm. at uh, age 29 in 1970. But the story of these folks, if we want to go on to the slide of Mrs. Jefferson, the story of these artists, um, what I discovered in going back and doing research, and it's not, and, and this, this idea was already written about, but I kind of turned the head of the story on, on in, in another way. Mrs. Jefferson, Zenobia Jefferson was an artist and an art teacher, and she's, she's got these artists going. And um, I was very excited when I thought about, well, instead of saying that a different artist um, prompted these folks into fame, I wanted to say, and, and we did say, that Mrs. Jefferson, as a student, went to Fisk University, and there, uh, she was a science major and an art major, and the very beautiful Aaron Douglas, who was the premier muralist painter of the Harlem Renaissance, was her teacher. Mm -hmm. And if, when you think about that, somebody of that promise, prominence, you know, one of the greatest artists of the day from the Harlem Renaissance was started an art department at Fisk, and she was his student. And we want to look at, this is a picture of Aaron Douglas and Mrs. Jefferson discussing a drawing. Um, and we can just leave it here for a sec. Yeah. Um, you know, when we learn something from somebody else, you know, I'm sure a lot of us in the solid, we get very excited about the history that we learn and we share it, right? You go into the schools with the education committee of, of our branch and you share everything you know. You give courses. We This is what we do when we learn about our culture. And because we know if we don't teach ourselves, no one else is going to do it for us. Right. And here is Zenobia before she was married in a classroom with Aaron Douglas, who she had to have known was right off of the Harlem Renaissance, right? And mm -hmm. here is Aaron Douglas right off of the Harlem Renaissance. And of course he's saying Langston Hughes and he's saying Zora Neale Hurston and he's saying, you know, all of the greats who were a part of the Harlem Renaissance, it's what we do. And so she learned from him. She left Fisk and she moved to um, Fort Pierce, Florida, again, on the East Coast. On the East married, Coast. Married Mr. <laughs> Jefferson. Uh -huh. and, um, and started an art department in Fort Pierce. And of course, we're, we're talking about segregation. Yep. And um, well, let's see what the next slide is. This is, a, yeah, this is one of the great paintings of Aaron Douglas. Some of you know this painting. It hangs in the Schomburg Center right now in New York City. It's very large. It's very beautiful. And of course, it's talking. He, he, his paintings were talking about the history of our lives in America, as well as our history of, of our lives in, uh, on the continent uh, in West Africa. And let's see what's next. And, and as, as we move to the next, um, talking about Douglas reminds me of all of the great men and women in our history. Uh, we, we couldn't take time to list, but, but who taught yes. either at an HBCU or at, at some local school and, and this is an example of that exposure. Uh, Ms. Jefferson exposed to an Aaron Douglas. She then takes that, shares it. Uh, again, I'm thinking of the theme of our conference, mm -hmm. the Black family, representation, yes. identity, yes. diversity. Yes. Uh, uh, what, a, what a wonderful opportunity these young people had. We recognize it today. We look back and we say, my God, they were taught by <laughs> this giant. 
Yeah, right. it's this giant. Yeah. And historically in black communities in the South and probably in, in um, parts of the North where Southern folks migrated, um, black teachers were a part of the community. They were part of the black community. They lived in the community, segregation again. And <clears throat> so a teacher would see a parent in the grocery store mm -hmm. and they would discuss the student, you know, where has the student, well, how's it? the student is fabulous, whatever the case may be. And so this, this, you know, this was a, a true meaning of the word community. You know, we, yes. we use that word a lot. And in this instance, in Fort Pierce, uh, which is the black community of, uh, I'm sorry, Lincoln Park, which is the black community of Fort Pierce, you know, the churches, the undertaker, the theater owner, the barber, mm -hmm. these are all great black folks who were um, really committed to raising up the community. And of course, we all know that once integration came, those businesses dried up because they either moved on to the white neighborhoods where they could make more money or the white folks moved into black neighborhoods so they could make money. Right. But in the in the in the earliest years, those these folks were the pillars of the community and they held everybody together. And I remember talking to our own um, Fred Atkins, the former mayor of Sarasota, about segregation in Sarasota and what it was like for him as a kid uh, living in Newtown and knowing that he could not cross Fruitville Avenue because that's where the segregation line was. That's where right. the color line was. Right. And and the same was true everywhere in America, in the United States at that time. And, you know, Mrs. Jefferson started this art department and these are her, these are young teenagers. Yeah. Uh, and some of them are some of the artists that became known as the African-American artists of Fort Pierce, which is what I like to call them, the African-American landscape artists. And um, we'll see a slide at the very end of our presentation, David. Mm -hmm of mm -hmm. Mrs. Jefferson as an elder yes. with these young men as grown men uh, in 2004 when they were inducted into the Florida Artist Hall of Fame. And, um, you know, um, spoiler alert, they it, 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 they say that if it wasn't for her, there yes. they would have said highwaymen. If it wasn't for her, there would have been no high, highwaymen. If it wasn't for her, there would be no artists. They, they would not have yeah. become artists. And, and um, you know, that's so important that they recognized her from a young woman out of college to mm -hmm. an elder in the community, that they knew who she was. And she was there for them all the way. She was there for the entire ride. And, yes. you know, a lot of us do that. You know, a lot and of I, I love this. I love this image of uh, young Black men and women uh, in, in an art studio, an art class. Yeah, uh, the, this is this is uh, contrary uh, to the image that the world at that time would have portrayed. And yes. and, and and thank God for Mrs. Jefferson, uh, who who obviously created this opportunity for for some of the artists we're going to talk about more uh, later uh, in 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 the in the uh, exhibit. It's, it's so true. It's yeah. so true. And look, look, these folks are interested. Now, maybe they're posing, but they're, they, they were in the classroom. And Alfred Hare, one of the artists in our exhibition and, and one of the artists that we're talking about today, um, uh, wanted to be an artist. You know, he said he wanted to be an artist. And he, be, with Mrs. Jefferson's help, really learned how to draw. He went to her home on Saturdays for weeks for Saturday drawing classes, his mother sent him to her. So we have a lot of women who are supporting mm -hmm. our children, right? Mm -hmm. And our men too. And Mrs. Jefferson's husband was Coach Jefferson. And he was a teacher and a football coach. Mm -hmm. And on the weekend, or not on the weekends, but on the weekdays, he look at these young guys. You know, he would drive around, he'd get in his car and drive around and check on them. Like, where are they? Like, yep. they should be at home. <laughs> and, uh, you know, yeah. so it was this this yeah. this sense of, you know, it's, it's very African, this sense of everybody plays a role and everybody knows what their role is and everybody knows um, how to respect everybody else's role. And I, that that feeling really and, and they, came home yes. for me in doing the yes. research on this on this uh, community. Yeah, a, a great, great example. Of, again, the black family. The, the, the black extended family 
the the community. Mm -hmm. uh, that's great. Let's 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 move here. So um, we know Zora Neale Hurston. Tell us why she's important to this story. Yeah, and we're people and wouldn't we're not associate gonna, her with the high women. No, <laughs> and with the African American art landscape pain is from Fort Pierce, <laughs> or, or as I like to say, the not high women. Yes, yes, the not high women <laughs> because they didn't name themselves That's that right. name. They That's are right. individuals. And I don't want to overplay Zora, but I mean, come on, y'all love Zora, and Zora yes. is from Florida, from Eatonville. Yes, and she died in Fort Pierce, and and I'm giving Zora her due because for the last two years of her life were in Fort Pierce. Um, mm -hmm. C. Bolden, who was a publisher of a black press called the Chronicle in in Fort Pierce, uh, invited her. He saw her somewhere, invited her to come to Fort Pierce to write for him. It was a very short lived experience. She wrote a couple of articles, one of them on Haitian Ludon, and she. I couldn't believe when somebody told me this. I spoke to a lot of people in Fort Pierce who, of course, know a lot of stories. And they said, oh, yeah, yeah, oh, I knew her. Mm -hmm. She was a <laughs> substitute teacher at the high school. I said, what? <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> Wait a minute. Zora yeah. Neale Hurston was an English teacher at your high school where yeah. our artists also went to school. Did Zora know that? Did Zora know? No, well, probably not. But. She was in the building and Mrs. Jefferson knew her. And I got that from her daughter. Hmm. Uh, her daughter told me that um, Zora and Mrs. Jefferson knew each other. And, and Zora didn't last long as a substitute teacher as she uh, was not well. And a lot of people looked after Zora in those last months of her life, including the teachers who uh, um, fed her and made sure that she was okay. And, did the kind of thing that we would do for somebody in need in the community. And I just love that she was there. And, and, and you know, there's so many, there's so many important people, I guess, if I can say important, so many great people. You know, I like to say, like, what was this confluence of energy? How did all these fantastic people, Zenobia Jefferson, her husband, Coach Jefferson, Beanie Backus, who we haven't gotten to yet, another mm -hmm. artist, you know, the artists themselves, mm -hmm. Zora, how, the, the publisher, um, how about Mr. Bolin, Dr. Bolin, who was a physician who built the Black Theater, the Lincoln Park Theater, and had, you know, like salons in his house where he and Zora and others would come and speak, you know, have these conversations around the yes. dinner table or after dinner. And how many more stories are there hidden in our communities? You know, that's what's so exciting to me. And uh, I just love that these folks landed in Fort Pierce at this time and somehow influenced each other, took care of each other, looked out for each other, mm -hmm. whatever the case may be. That that energy, that spirit existed in one place at that time. Well, and in I, fact, really, we, I really like that. I do too. And, and, and we do know that there are many instances of Fort Pierce's uh, throughout our history. Yes. Communities where we've all grown up and, and uh, great people, men and women, uh, have emerged uh, out of again that that black family core and and right. support. Right. I think we've got a. a this is uh, Zora's uh, house in Fort Pierce. This is Zora's house in Fort Pierce. You can see that it has a historic marker in front of it. Mm -hmm. it, it was in another location around the corner. I'm not sure why they moved it here, but but it's on the historic trail. There's there are several. Homes. Alfred Harris' home was on the trail. Marianne Carroll's home was on the trail. She's an she's the only woman artist of the group. Uh, Beanie Backus, who is the white artist who helped uh, uh, Alfred um, create by observation his marketing scheme, which I'll tell mm -hmm. you about in a minute. Mm -hmm. um, and so there are several. Fort Pierce reveres these folks and calls them the highwaymen because that's what's known. And they are, they're actually building a highwayman museum. Um, and that's, you know, that's fine, but I'm, because I'm an artist, because I'm in the field of museums and museum education, I, I want to raise up Harold Newton and Alfred Hare and Marianne Carroll and James Gibson and Roy McClendon and Sam Newton and on and on because they are full grown humans and deserve to be seen as such. I love that uh, you've, you've taught me that as we've talked about 
this collection, this collective of artists, uh, I, I, I leave clearly understanding uh, <laughs> that they are so much more than that, that label given them yes. uh, by people who were yes. probably seeking to profit. Uh, let's let's transition in. You've talked about Harold Newton, Alfred Hare, Marianne Carroll, three right. of the best known artists. Um, why? Why? Why do they jump out at us? Uh, well, you tell me. <laughs> what do you see here? Does this speak to you? Does it re resonate in any way? It it does, and I've seen. And you you you've helped me understand the difference between an Alfred Hare and a Harold Newton. Uh, uh, just, just the, the different use of color, the different use of light. Uh, uh, I, I think uh, Newton does more with the water, with the sea, the lake. Uh, it's, it's. Uh, I've, I've learned an enormous amount uh, in, in this in this exploration. Yeah, and I, I'm glad to hear that um, because it's worth it's worth. The investigation, because you can apply those kinds of skills, young people, ourselves, we can apply those kinds of observational skills on other things, right, mm -hmm. in other ways in our lives. Mm -hmm. And the reason why Harold um, and Alfred and Marianne are highlighted in this exhibition is because, again, I wanted to step back and like spend time on just a few people so that our, so that our visitors, the viewers, the folks on this, on this video, um, on this Zoom could begin to see that the artworks are not all alike and they have a reputation of, oh, highly men, they, they all look the same. They're all it's repetitious. Well, some of their scenes are the same, I will agree. Yes. Uh, but each one is different and, and, and individual. And Harold Newton's looking at them again, there, there are no people in his scenes. Mm. Um, and, and they're kind of unobstructed. Mm -hmm. Right, mm -hmm. you can mm -hmm. step right into the water, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and there's there's kind of like a breath. There's an expansiveness there that like, ah, like oh yeah, <laughs> that's mm -hmm. beautiful. You know, it's interesting since 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 beginning this project with you, uh, three of our branch members learning about what we were proposing sent me art, uh, some from Newton, some from Hare uh that they'd collected over the years oh. uh they identified as the highwaymen art and they and they were uh but they were all very different from just just you know again our own within our own branch and yes. yeah uh this is um a really well-known alfred Hare. this is a and and why it's well known is because alfred loved this tree the royal mm -hmm. Ponciana. Mm -hmm. And he painted them a lot, as did many people. And I'm guessing there must have been a lot of Royal Ponciana trees in Fort Pierce. They just must have been blooming everywhere. Because I was looking in Sarasota a couple of months ago. There, there was one down the street from me. And I heard somebody say they saw one on a drive. But they weren't everywhere. Mm -hmm. But they must have been everywhere in, uh, in Fort Pierce at the time. And sadly, of course, land development has reduced some of the beauty of our state. And, yeah. you know, we're really grateful that they captured it. And I think that's one of the reasons why the paintings are so loved, uh, because we get a glimpse on, on the flora and the fauna, the trees, the, the landscape, the, the water that has changed in the last uh, 50 years. Yes. More. More yeah. than 50 years. We, we so think of old, old Florida, old Florida. Right? They call it old Florida. Yeah. And, and, you know, Harold's paintings were more slow brush strokes. He took mm. more time painting them. And Alfred and a lot of the others were known for quick, rapid, keep it moving, keep it moving. Because um, Alfred learned, Alfred was in high school. And Beanie Backus, who was a regional artist, a white landscape artist who lived in Fort Pierce had come to the high school to offer his, his studio, his services, his expertise to the best art student that the school wanted to send. And he would mentor that student. And Zenobia sent Alfred. Hmm. And, you know, Alfred crossed the color line to go to his home. And as I don't know, some of the folks in the audience might know, artists are pretty generous people and they like people. Well, some of them like people. <laughs> <laughs> and he was willing to share and and his widow 
uh, Doretha here at Truesdale, who was a really wonderful woman who came back to Fort Pierce and is in their original home, her and Alfred's home with her husband of today, an, a photographer, John. Um, she would tell me stories about uh, Alfred and what life was like when he was painting. And, you know, she said Alfred was a businessman and mm -hmm. Alfred loved art. And he knew he wanted to be an artist, but he also wanted to make money. And all of these young men, I mean, we, we know this, those of us who have looked at Florida history and Southern history, we're, there were not a lot of choices for us in the 50s and the 60s and earlier, obviously. And they did not want to come out of high school and pick fruit or tomatoes, well, tomatoes or fruit. They wanted something else. And these folks, you know, it's not like they just you know, dropped from the sky and picked up a paintbrush. Oh, I'll try that. Well, of course, somebody may have, but these folks are artists. <laughs> you don't paint like that if you're not an artist. You, mm -hmm. you, you, some of it truly is learned and some of it you're born with, right? I mean, practice makes perfect, but you're born with something that keeps you moving in this regard. I want, I'm an artist. Remember I said to you, when you want to introduce me, I said, make, does it say I'm an artist? That's right. <laughs> because that's first on my list, you know, yeah. it's how I walk in the world. Yes. And these folks were artists too. And Alfred was a businessman. When he went to Beanie's house, he noticed that, Be that white clientele were coming into Beanie's studio and paying cash money for a painting. And Alfred observed this multiple times. And Alfred said, huh, if mm -hmm. Beanie can make cash money off of those paintings, I can do that too. Yeah. And then he said, but I'm going to make more paintings because oil paints take a long time to paint and a long time to dry. And so maybe Beanie got a hundred bucks for one painting and Alfred would make, you know, 20 paintings and get 200 bucks in the same amount of time. Yeah. And it worked. And it worked for Alfred and for most of the artists. And what happened over time, um, there, there, became, there became two, I hope this is not too strong, but two schools. Like there was the Harold School and the Alfred School. And the Alfred School was fast and quick. They got it done and they painted quickly. They had a palette knife. Some of them worked. I've heard the expression assembly line. I don't like to use it because people get yeah. stuck on these ideas. Yeah. But yes, uh, Alfred would invite you over to his house and he had a, a line in the carport, a clothesline, and they put Upson board, which is, a, which is a building material, it was inexpensive on the line. And he would say to someone, do blue for the sky and green for the grass and I'll come back in and I'll do the trees. And <laughs> so some of them helped in this way and then they, also learned and then they went off to paint themselves and they made a lot of money and um they, they made so much money i mean alfred was going out himself selling to people and of course the white folks didn't really want them at their door and you know marianne carroll is known to have said you know if i felt the least bit intimidated by the energy i backed up and went home yeah you know yeah. Yes. And some people went to the back door. So we had to go through all of these machinations, right? And um, Al Black became their best. I mean, Al Black worked for Harold, Harold, uh, sorry, for Alfred. Alfred made enough money to pay Al Black and other men to sell the paintings. And they would get in their cars and put the wet paintings in the trunk. I love that. I love that. Drive, this is why they got the name Harlem and drive down. <laughs> 41 up and down the yeah. east coast yeah and sell the paintings yeah. and they would sell the paintings in hospitals doctor's offices dentist offices beauty yeah. salons places where people needed a lot of art because it was very inexpensive and where people did not you know were, were willing to do business willing to exchange with black folks yeah <laughs> I, I love it i love the story you've told me about about mr black leaving with a carload of of the art and not coming home until it was until, all sold. That's right. <laughs> Marianne and Carol said, um, uh, Miss Al, Al didn't come home till he sold all the paintings. And it, yeah. uh, if he didn't sell all the paintings, it's only because they didn't give them to him. Yeah, yeah. They were, you know, so Al was really good at his job. Yeah. And eventually he, he painted himself. So let's see what else we have. Yeah. 
on the screen. Harold Newton again. Harold Newton. I mean, look at the clouds, the coloring on the clouds, the light at the top of the big puff and the blue behind it. The colors are not flat. They're nuanced. Um, this yeah. is not something you can do quickly. You have to like really know what that, what is that, an egret? You have to really know what that bird looks like. You have to really know what those palms look like. You have to really know how a cloud is formed in order to paint it in such a lush way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think, uh, yeah, I was going to say Marianne Carroll here. And uh, here's Marianne. The, the, soul, the soul woman. in The, the soul, the heart of the show. <laughs> mm. The heart of the highway woman <laughs> uh, <laughs> is Marianne Carroll. And I hope you're not distracted by the buzzing outside. Um, Marianne Carroll was the only woman, and I don't know why, but the, the way she joined the club, so to speak, is that she lived across the street, down the street from um, Alfred. And yeah. she would she would drop by. You know how you, before COVID, you drop by somebody's house and uh -huh. you're, hey, what's going on? And uh -huh. well, she would drop by. She would see him outside painting and and uh, and she would just drop by and she would watch what he was doing and she would get interested and she picked up a brush and Alfred showed her how to paint. And obviously she loved it. She painted until the end, which was mm -hmm. the Christmas before it was December 2019. Lived a long life. She lived a long life and right. she painted the entire time. And, you mm -hmm. know, I, I object to the name Highwaymen, but I'm not going to fight you about it because she embraced the name. I mean, mm -hmm. it was helpful for them in terms of sales. I'm not going to fight about it. But yeah. just again, from the perspective of humanity, uh, I want to give each artist their due. And, and because they didn't name themselves that I want to really respect the fact that, you know, Alfred never heard that name. Right. He died, he died in, in 70 and the name came, uh, was coined in 95. And um, Sam Newton, who is still alive and well, and we'll see a picture at the end, who was the brother of Harold Newton. Sam is also a painter. And there's another brother who was a painter. Sam gets very adamant about that name. And, you know, he gets like an attitude and said, that's not our name. That's not my name. It's what Harold didn't want that name. So I'm, I'm, I'm being respectful of, I mean, it's just like anything else. How do we want to be called? You know, exactly, exactly, exactly. And, and, and to the, again, back to uh, representation and identity. Exactly. I mean, we, we know better today. We, we, we have the benefit of, of this exhibit and understanding who these people were. Uh, that, that in the 50s and 60s, I do what I need to do to survive, to sell these paintings, to feed my family. Call me what you want. I need to survive. Well, we're way beyond that now. And we, have an, we should have an appreciation for these art artists and their art. Exactly. And, yeah. and so back to Marianne Carroll. I mean, yes. Marianne Carroll's paintings if you look back at the two men before her, the two artists before her, they have this kind of, you, you can see the brush stroke. You mm -hmm. know? Mm -hmm. It's very obvious. Marianne's are flat. You can see, look at the, like the feathering effect on the tree for, for Alfred. Marianne's are kind of thick mm -hmm. and tasty and dense and flat. And she's less concerned, or maybe she's more concerned with the finish. Hmm. You know, that the finish is thick and lustrous, maybe even in its own way. So she has a different feel for her subject matter than, and, and she should, because she's a different human. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And people, <laughs> I've heard people say, collectors, I've run into quite a few now, like if they're outside here in Sarasota and the sky turns orange, we, we know people go to the beach to, they, the entertainment for the night is watching the sun go down. Yes. And um, people will say, oh, it's a Marianne Carroll sunset. Did you see that Marianne Carroll sunset? <laughs> <laughs> yep, yeah. Marianne Carroll sunset, really beautiful. All right, let's 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 move through uh, Alfred okay. Hare. Alfred Hare, this is a kind of, this painting, you know, the show is going to be up at Selby Gardens for a few more days after the conference. and. 
if anybody's in the area, it's worth seeing. It's 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 a nice show. Yes. This painting was painted, okay, 70, 80, 90, 100, 110, 120. How many years is that? That this painting looks so fresh. It looks like mm -hmm. it was painted yesterday. I was really shocked when I saw it. This painting looks brand new and that energy, Alfred captured that energy. Uh, and I, I think there are a lot of artists that wish that they could do that. And so I don't, you know, I know that people want to turn these artists work into, um, you know, categorize them in a way that where they want to compare them with other art forms. And I just don't do that. I just don't think that we should judge, if you, wave, if, if you will, if judge is the right word. I think these artists and their artwork stands alone because of the quality of the expression mm -hmm. and because of the numbers, the sheer numbers, they, thousands, hundreds of thousands of paintings because they sold to a community development out in, uh, in, in East Florida. Um, you, you know, they, they, they deserve to have the stories told about them in a way that raises them up as artists. And you've described hair as being fast, uh, quick uh, for for the purpose. I, I and I, I I don't see that. I can't I can't imagine <laughs> this being done. Isn't that uh, interesting? Yeah, yeah, no. It, 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 and uh, and it was with you know what a palette you know what a palette knife looks yes. like. It's got a, yes. a flat yes uh, surface, uh, not a brush. Zoop, 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 zoop. Remarkable. You know. Yes, remarkable. It really is. Yeah, let's see yeah. some more. Okay. Harold Newton. Harold Newton's stormy sail. Hmm. Again, you know, a man on the horizon, a man on the boat. What's he thinking about when he's painting these things? Hmm. You know, <clears throat> that comes to mind for me as an artist. Like what, what is in the mind of the creator? What is in the soul of the creator? What is the creator putting into the canvas? Because we, we are, artists do put their own medicine if you will mm -hmm. into well, the being, camps i think yes yeah, i was gonna say being from florida i'm looking at this and i see a storm i, I see a storm coming the the the, the, the cloud uh the dark uh the the, the boats yes. really captured it. he's captured that so uh so so powerfully yeah it's beautiful mm -hmm. let's see what else we have yeah. and look at this sky this is a beautiful painting Hmm. called fire sky and he did several fire skies mm -hmm. i mean you can't help it if you live here in central florida you can't help but see these scenes all the time and uh you know i don't think that's easy to do <laughs> to paint in that way to make the striation of the orange and then to have it reflected look at the reflection on the water mm -hmm. and then look at the little reflection to the far left on the grasses just on a little bit of the grass and on the edge of the tree. Yes. That's yes. really observation. You know, that's really great observation. You know, other artists, other people might have just made that whole clump dark mm -hmm. and not mm -hmm. thought about, well, you know, the light, he's really looking, the light is filtering Highlight. down. Yes. It's really highlighted and uh, he adds that dimension. And then, you know, what's going on in the center, like the branch stretching out almost to meet the reflection of the two palms mm -hmm. and then the two birds. I mean, there's a, you know, what's the story in that? What's he thinking about when he's um, in the midst of designing this composition, you know? What's what's going on in his head? That's why I said that these paintings were healing for me when I hung yeah. them up on my wall and uh, they really have something to say. They're very expressive. This is this is perfectly titled, I think. Uh, perfectly fire. titled. Yeah, you look at it, and, and immediately the the image, uh, the heat, uh, and it's and it's a Florida evening. <laughs> Harold Newton again. Harold Newton again. You know, and there's several of these. We have another one in the show. Um, you know, this idea of looking at looking closely, looking at details. I know that you know in the museum world museums have been training doctors and policemen and firemen, public servants to hmm. come into the art galleries, come and look at, look closely at paintings, deeper looking so that their observational skills are better. 
so that mm -hmm. we don't quickly look at the brother on the street and decide mm -hmm. that he's something that he's mm -hmm. not. Mm -hmm. But instead, we take our time and using our observational skills and like really take in who is that? Who, who, what is, where is the humanity there is? Who is that human in front of us? And that's one of the things we can learn from a painter like Harold, who was taking his time to really, really look at what a hibiscus looks like and mm. the leaves and P.S. Go check them out. They look like that. <laughs> what, what, am I, what am I seeing and what message am I getting in that uh, observation? Yeah, that's... This is one of my favorites, the, the, the mixing of the reds and the oranges and the darks and the lights. Marianne Carroll again. Marianne Carroll. And look at the purple background behind the mm -hmm. orange clouds. And Marianne mm -hmm. has these kind of crazy colors. I shouldn't say crazy because I don't mean that. <laughs> Marianne has these crazy, these wild turquoises yeah, and yeah. oranges next to each other. And there's a turquoise tree. Uh, they're beautiful. Right. And they're so African when you want to look at it in terms of color. This is the way African colors. I don't mean to generalize about an entire continent, lots of countries and regions and people. Mm -hmm. But, you know, when we think about certain parts of the continent, we see beadwork, right, that's full of these colors. We see mm -hmm. textiles that full of these colors. I just thought about that for the first time. And, you know, our inspiration is deep. You know, what, what we have as Black folks and all people, but what we have as Black folks in our ancestry, in our line, goes back to the continent. And we may not know it in a conscious way. Some of us do know it in a conscious way, but it comes out. And mm -hmm. that's what I see here now. That's what I see. Seeing the earth, seeing the land, and, and appreciating its, its existence, uh, its meaning for us, our relationship to it, it's very much our, our heritage, I think. And, and that's what um, I see these artists capturing and, and perhaps what we've lost in, in New Florida <laughs> with subdeve subdevelopments and, yeah. and destruction. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, here's the young man. Here's the young man. There's, there's Alfred as a kid in high school. Doesn't look too much like a kid, does he? The mustache, I guess. And you can see under ambition, it says artist. Mm -hmm. And then on the right, uh, there he is as the artist. With, I noticed the other day, there's a record player behind him. You, the I, kind see of, <laughs> I see it. I see it. There's an exhibition. I hope folks have a chance to come. We have some objects on the, in, in glass cases. And one of the objects that I selected were records from, you know, Sam Cooke and mm -hmm. Uh, uh, Otis Redding and James Brown. These are, I asked Doretha Hare Truesdale, what did did he did he play music when he painted? And she said, Oh yeah, it was radio was always on. He was always playing records. <laughs> and I said, What was his favorite? He, uh, she said, Oh James Brown, please, please, please. <laughs> so there's yeah. a I got a, a, I found a James Brown record and a couple other records that we put in the exhibition just for context, like. Because these folks are painting, you know, segregation, mm -hmm. it's the Vietnam War, it's mm -hmm. um, Earth Day, it's hippies, it's marijuana. Yeah, yeah, uh, he's in 60s. It's the civil rights yeah. movement, it's the Black yeah. Power movement, it's the Black yeah. Arts movement, and this is what's happening here. And so maybe we want to say, oh, they were out of touch, but I just say, no, they had something else to say. And maybe, you know, maybe there's, there's stories, maybe this is like, amulets for healing because mm -hmm. we, we also had lynching here right and you yes. had the murder of Henry Moore here so uh yes. who, who knows and they're not here for me to ask them but one of the be beautiful things about art is that you can interpret it you you can ask the artist what is it about and sometimes artists will say whatever you take from it mm -hmm. is what mm -hmm. it is about so, mm -hmm. so so for me it's about what is the context in which they painted what yes. was happening around them that might have influenced them and you know what of that influence can i see and what of them do i see at the same time yes yes i think we have uh, this is this is harold or sam harold this is harold mm -hmm. um he he that's his camper he drove around a lot and lived a lot of places but in this 
mid central Florida area. Yeah, he was area. over here in Sarasota and Bradenton for a while, mm -hmm. and but mostly Fort Pierce and um, others, other towns across the way on the East Coast. And this is Mary Ann Carroll. Mary Ann Carroll on the left as the, at the age in which she was paint, first started painting. Mm -hmm. And Mary Ann Carroll as the painter she was, uh, you know, for all the days of her life. I mean, it's a great picture. Yeah, uh, it is. It you is. Know, pure joy in both of them, I think. Yes, yes. And Beanie, Bac is Beanie Bacchus. A.E. Bean Bacchus was the artist that, uh, introduce um, the concept of marketing to Alfred, as well as uh, helping him to lay down a landscape, the composition for a landscape. Zenobia Jefferson taught him about drawing and, you know, seeing and uh, expression and emotion, mm -hmm. other aspects of being an artist. You know, it was a school in segregation, they didn't have any money. And so when the materials ran out, like, pencils, paper, crayons, maybe, I don't know, but they didn't have oil paint and Alfred wanted to paint and that's where Beanie Bacchus gets into the picture. And think, yeah, I thought about this and didn't share this in the show, but oil paint is expensive. Oil mm -hmm. paint is one of the most expensive uh, tools of the trade, materials. Um, and I was thinking about that. They painted with oil paints. Where did they really didn't make a lot of money to afford oil paints because they painted a lot of paintings and the oil paint is not cheap. And they didn't use canvas because they were saving money. They used Upson board, which is a cardboard kind of a material. But that's just kind of fascinating to me when I thought about it recently. Oh, they use oil. They didn't use acrylic. They didn't use watercolor. They use oil paint, which is a fine artist tool. So they're really, it's really elevated. I mean, their sense of self and how I am creating is elevated. and. I don't think we should, I think we should really honor that. I think we should really notice that. So was, was, it, was it, was it um, utilitarian? I mean, that was the oil painting uh, going to allow them to, to stack it and, and move it more quickly? Or is it a, a, a artistic choice? It's, an art, it's a creative choice because oil paint takes a very long time to dry. You said that, yeah. And, um, you know, Al Black would put these paints, paintings in the car and some of them would still be wet. He would be selling, <laughs> selling wet paintings. Um, so it really was, I'm, I'm guessing because I love oils myself, I'm guessing that it was a choice. It was a conscious choice because of the way the paint moves around on the surface. Mm. It's, it glides and, <clears throat> excuse me, acrylic paint, you have to move very quickly and it dries, it dries very fast. Uh. If you, stop painting you are stuck with that line that shape that whatever oil paint you have lots of time to move it around and change it which is why those paintings could could be done fast because the painting moves quickly itself i see but again it's a very expensive medium uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that's kind of interesting to me it is it is which is a good thing they made a lot of money so they could that's right that's right oh i forgot to put the artist here uh, but this is Roy McClendon, and um, we've got a photo of Roy later here. We do have a photo of Roy, who's still painting. He's in his late 80s. I talked to him on the phone when I was doing my research. He was very warm, and um, I, I do have to say, everybody I've met related to this group of folk have been really, really beautiful people, really caring kind, generous people. I, I I don't know if that's part of the story, but I bet it's part of the story. I think it's part of the story. Part of the story. And, and not and, all of these painters painted Black folks, which I, and I think that for the collectors, I'm curious to know how many collectors who are not mostly of African descent mm -hmm. uh, purchase or collect the paintings with the Black images in them. Hmm. Hmm. I, I don't know. Yeah, interesting. And look Another at this, I mean, gorgeous. This is very classy. I think the shapes are very sophisticated. Look at the shape of that tree. Look at the shape of the branches, mm -hmm. the trunk. It's not just a stick going up. That's, that's 
you know, that kind of undulating um, pattern that the trunk makes across the picture plane is very beautiful and really mm-hmm. shows you how strong the eye is mm. to see it and then mm-hmm. how strong the hand is to paint it. I even know in the in the previous of so the same. If you look at you said un, undulating. I look at the house. Look at the look at the house in this. Yes. And in this. I mean, it, very interesting. They're not straight up and 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 squared. They're uh, moving. Uh, yeah, that's that's uh, that's outstanding. Wow. Another, Alfred Hare. This is your favorite. Yeah. Yeah. Full bloom. Yeah. Okay. And here's another version of a Royal Ponciana. I mean, mm-hmm. compared to Alfred's Royal Ponciana, it's a different tree. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Uh, but still mm-hmm. very interesting to look mm-hmm. at. And the course, collector, yeah. the owner of this painting, uh, lent it to his grown son who lives in Miami. And the grown son took it to uh, a game shop, a game designer. Hmm. And what did he turn it into? I wanted him to say he turned it into a puzzle, but he, he turned it into the image, turned it into um, a paint set, like paint by numbers kind of a thing. Ah, okay. But I think it would be fantastic if it was a puzzle. Try to put mm-hmm. all those puzzle pieces together. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And yeah, this, I you know, think. Willie Daniels, I mean, there's a lot of air in this painting, I, which is different. I mean, it's not, everything's not like densely packed. Uh, into this, into the canvas, into the surface, into the mm-hmm. landscape, but it's it's kind of open, and I'm I'm guessing that that was his personality as well. This kind of open mm-hmm. um, way of being in the world. The there's a picture air. of yeah, so picture mm-hmm. of Willie coming up. How are we doing on time? Well, we're we're going to move through, uh, but but I just I love looking at these images. Very different Alfred Hare here, I think. This is an early one, and you can. I, see. I was going to imagine that was earlier in his career. Yeah, and yeah. I love it. I love the the kind of ones that are a little bit more raw while they're figuring things out, and they're mm-hmm. a little less finessed. I I appreciate uh-huh. that because there's a lot of emotion in that, a lot of energy, and it's also signed Freddie. He was Freddie. I see that. Yeah. You can see it. Yeah, <laughs> uh, Alfred Freddie Hair. Hair. That's yeah. Right. And this this is a beautiful one too. You know. Maybe I do not see that. How how do you see that painting? It, it's is, it's it's more it's more stark than than what we've come to see. What I've come to see is Alfred Hare. Uh, but but I'm sure it is what he saw in that particular view. Uh, very different than the Royal Ponciana. But but he captures the the egrets and and the ground cover. Uh, and, and the 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 is it is it almost a mustard green or an a, an olive green? Mm-hmm. Um, very different. Very different. I still, I still can't imagine. I still can't imagine him doing it with a palette knife. <laughs> <laughs> no, no way. Pretty no. funny. And then this is Sam. Mm. This is Harold Newton's younger brother. There's yeah. another brother too, Lemuel, and. Um, Sam, did I say this already, was very adamant about not calling the folks. Yes. Uh, and Sam is alive and well and working in, uh, he has a gallery in uh, lower, the lower, <laughs> in Southern East Florida. Florida, okay. I think I think we, we do have those those photos. This is these are the yeah. two brothers side by side. Huh? Side by side. Just wanted to take a look at them and see mm-hmm. You know the the similarities and the differences. It just kind of contrasts them a little bit, and mm-hmm. I I feel like we are looking at a similar scene until we look a little closer and we see the trees are different. Uh, they're different types of trees, but but the composition is not the same, but similar and beautiful. I, but different painters clearly. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, Sam's paintings have are a little edgier, I would say. And Harold's paintings are a little more expansive. Um, both very interesting yes. to live yeah. with, I, I think. The interesting interesting to know if, if Sam was modeling his after his his older brothers, probably. Yeah. 
<laughs> or probably so. <laughs> we'll have to call him up and ask him. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Okay. There's a and hibiscus again. Another hibiscus. Yeah. And this is the one we started with uh, at yeah. the top. Yeah. He was the over Braden, here. Bradenton scene. Mm -hmm. He was in Bradenton. And then yeah. this is the piece that the Smithsonian, that the National Museum of African American History and Culture purchased. And so cool. it's in their collection with, with several others. And it's, I really think it's quite a beautiful painting. I, I think there's a whole lot in there. The, look at that ocean. That ocean is deep, mm -hmm. right? You forget mm -hmm. that you're looking at a flat canvas, right? You're looking at a yeah. board. Yes. You know, yes. there's so much dimension in it and personality and, uh, and de he deserves to be called anything he wants to be called. Exactly. Which I think was Harold, <laughs> exactly. Harold Newton. And exactly. um, this is an installation, an interior view. This is what the show, one of the rooms in the show uh, yes. at the Selby Gardens. We just wanted to give you an idea of how these paintings hung in this hang in the space. They're still there right now. And, and we have one if more. Not, if you've not visited and you're able, please, it's beautiful. It is beautiful. Selby is, is an excellent venue for this. Perfect to be in a botanical garden with all these landscape paintings. Yes. And yeah. here's another. Here's the other angle of that mm -hmm. same room, just to give you an idea. It is beautiful. And there's and, Roy. And there's Roy. There's <laughs> Roy. He's in his 80s now. He's still painting, still has things to say. Yeah. Still, yeah. he was a, also a teacher. And so, you know, he has a lot of memories and uh, interest in keeping the history going. Excellent. Excellent. And this beautiful. is Willie. Look at that painting. That's beautiful. Still, too. Willie's still alive as well. Well, he's still alive, hanging around in Fort Pierce. Fort Pierce. And we did say then, we had one of Sam. And this is Sam. And, you know, felt it was fitting since this is a conference about the Black family, mm -hmm. that we have Sam and his family and Sam and his brother, Harold. And, you know, look at all the paintings. He's still at, he's still doing it and obviously teaching the little girl, yes. uh, you know, how to be an artist, whether she wants to be one or not, just to be brought up in that atmosphere. Exactly. is valuable exactly it's priceless priceless all and right here we are back yeah. at the beginning and yes to mrs jefferson uh as we said earlier in the presentation that this was in 2004 at the florida artist hall of fame and you know you just i you, i feel them i feel the men in the picture hmm. i feel their presence as like solid proud citizens and she's right there with them uh she's proud too she's proud yeah. of them and i i just oh. i think it's a great great photograph absolutely absolutely a wonderful way for us to uh conclude and and to thank uh radia for this this marvelous tour uh the, these the, introducing us to these wonderful artists um what do you want us to, to take away, Radia, as we close? Well, I want us to remember that um, our humanity, I mean, we as individuals, as a group, that we deserve to be seen how we want to be seen, and we deserve to be called how we want to be called, named how we want to be named, and, and to take time. You know, art heals. Art is something that we can explore as people of color to express ourselves, to take care of ourselves to help somebody else and uh, having art in the mainstream of our life rather as an afterthought is a very strong way to uh, live in the world um, because you can turn to it and have it in your pocket, have it on your wall, have it as a comfort, have it as a, as a career, you know? Um, and I think that we need that. I think that the more creativity and the more imagination, we're going to need that as the world yes. keeps turning. I mean, we're going to need it more. And we are yes. going to be turning to creative and imaginary, imaginative people to solve the world's problems because everything else is crashing. And creativity is really going to be the thing that's going to turn us around. And wow. I, let's hone that skill. Absolutely. Radia, thank you again on behalf of all Asalites everywhere. This has been a blessing. And thank you all for joining us. And we're going to close with a, a lovely 
uh, spoken word poem by Melanie Lavender. Again, thank you all for joining. Thank us. you. Thank you. Hello, I'm Melanie Lavender, and today I'm going to recite for you a piece entitled Mind's Eye. This piece is dedicated to the men and women, African Americans, who decided during Jim Crow to not pick fruit on trees, but to paint. These Florida landscape artists change the narrative of work. Please enjoy. Moments in time captured by the artist's brush. Childhood scenes captured in their memories of Florida's simple beauty. Sunsets of gold, purples, and pinks engraved in the iris of my mind's eye. It takes me to a safe place where all my worries float away into the waters of the Atlantic. Hands kissed by the creator of heaven and earth. Minds encouraged and guided by Zenobia who saw the potential to change the narrative of work with I am phrases. What boldness it took to say I won't be picking fruit on trees. Instead, I'll paint the images of my childhood hide and seek secret spots. The grit of those held under Jim Crow's laws to not allow hate and fear to keep them from knocking on doors. They were building legacies by following the callings of their heart to paint, hands anointed by grace to capture the landscape designed by the divine. I'm convinced there is something special about this place we call Florida. To birth such talents like Zora, Marianne, and I Am Black, just to name a few. See, these gifts couldn't be just taught. Their art included soul, which gave them to the power to transform a white world with colors. I close my eyes and pretend to be an owl in the tree just to witness these painters create art on an assembly line. Alfred Hare sharing the techniques learned over some beers while the music flowed in backyards. This group of 26 artists followed the path of the 27 from Edenville to build along the A1A. The same road traveled by Harry and Harriet Moore, who I imagine drove while daydreaming of a world where colors were bold and celebrated and free just to be themselves. Imagine with me sitting in the arts. Go ahead, close your eyes and hear the music of the birds and the crickets, the feel of the evening breeze as the last rays from daylight change the colors of the sky from blue, then purple with a dash of pink. Next following the yellows and the oranges until the colors and vibrations collide into one twisting the sky black. And now the stars and moon take center stage. This is the world we dream of. Now, so have you. Thank you. Are we still recording? <laughs>